Hi, this is Ryan Fraser. This is Troy Daney. This is Gus Boyet. This is Don Hutchison. This is Jürgen Klopp, and you're listening to The Big Interview with Graham Hunter. Thank you, Jürgen. I travelled to all these interviews from Barcelona, and our socios, our beloved members, keep us on the road. This independent podcast would not happen without them. Please go to patreon.com forward slash Graham Hunter right now to become a socio, to become one of our members and get an extra big interview every month, plus loads of bonus content. So go to patreon.com forward slash Graham Hunter, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Graham Hunter, and we'll bring you joy. There'll be cynics amongst you who think that the brilliant Eniola Aluko, title winner in Italy, is only on the big interview because her brilliant brother, Shani Aluko, played for the Mighty Dandies and scored in a 2-2 draw with Bayern Munich. No, no. But the reason that Eni and I met at Juventus training ground, Lenovo, just outside Turin, and talked about life in that city and work at this monumental institution of a football club is that after a hugely successful career winning just about everything that there is to win, she decided on another challenge in Serie A, women's Serie A, where Juve are not but a two-year-old club. She arrives, she helps make them champions again, but now she gives to us a brilliant perspective on the impact of and stories behind the 2019 World Cup. You're right, she was broadcasting it, not playing in it. We touch on the fact about whether she should have been trying to help England get beyond the semi-final and into the final. Listen on, you'll hear her answer. Annie also talked brilliantly about the perspective she gained while writing her book. It's a cathartic perspective on the pivotal time in her career when, over a course of more than 18 months, any fought a culture around the England coaching team. It's a fight she won at a cost, but when she reflects on that and what it's done to her and how she feels now, I guarantee you'll be interested and a little bit surprised. Any Aluko, double winner in Italy and England for Chelsea, lawyer, pioneer, brilliant analyst. She's a perfect fit for the big interview. It's not often that we record the big interview abroad, but that's not the reason for my excitement today, nor is the fact that we're speaking to the sister of an Aberdeen legend. <laughs> but that is true. No, we're with Enya Luko, who is, well, amongst many other things, newly champion of Italy. And I adore sportsmen and women who take risks, particularly cultural risks, and then go and succeed. So any one, Thank you for receiving me in our gypsy band here at the Juventus Training Centre. Bentonati. Um, Bentonati, no. Benvenuti. Benvenuti, excuse me. Molto grazie, Anton. <laughs> now, listen, before we even start the interview, I, I had to laugh when we were communicating via Twitter because I can't speak Italian, but I could hear phrases and I wrote them down phonetically. And your answer came back absolutely in beautiful Italian. I went, <laughs> OK, there's a learning lesson for me already. We might be here to talk about your book, They Don't Teach This, but you've taught me already how to improve my Italian. How is your Italian? And don't be modest. It's OK. It's OK. I think after one year, um, it's taken time. Um, but I can... The way I judge it is how I can operate in sort of everyday situations with the coach or with the teammates or in a taxi or in a restaurant. I think I'm very comfortable in, in all of those situations now. Whereas when I first arrived, the first six months, I was so sometimes afraid to, to sort of speak to the taxi driver in case he, you know, I didn't understand or I didn't understand everything the coach was saying. Now I feel pretty much comfortable with everything the coach is saying with communicating with my teammates, um, with ordering at a restaurant. So I feel good, but there's still a lot, a lot, a lot to learn. Because I've, I've, I've got to still think 
before, you know, I still make mistakes like, like just a minute ago when I said bentonati rather than benvenuti. I know what I want to say, but sometimes... Bentonati was welcome. Bentonati is welcome Happy back. returns, yeah. Whereas so in that case, is, uh, you, you've twice now st already <laughs> struck on something that I think is cool because in the book you explain how um, with your Nigerian her heritage and you consider there's a hyphen, mm. British Nigerian, Occasionally, you must feel Nigerian British. But there's a moment where you quickly pick up um, the language that uh, your parents are speaking, and you're extremely sharp at understanding and teaching yourself before you've even been probably taught anything at primary yeah, school. Or, yeah. And therefore, you, you seem to have a linguistic ability. But you said, um, at the beginning, I was a bit afraid. When you're brought up in Britain, what I understand is that most people are taught to be afraid of, of trying something in a yeah, foreign language. No, We're taught to be embarrassed for, for no good reason yeah. whatsoever. But did you have to conquer that at all? Well, um, that's a really great point, because I think actually when you travel um, around the world, which I love to do, you find that people are much, much more uh, advanced in their knowledge of other languages. So, for example, people are much are better at speaking English mm -hmm. than English, you know, British kids are at speaking other languages. Um, so I just think it's a cultural thing, really, that you know we take for granted the fact that we can speak English. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, I mean, there's two levels to it. The, the surface level is that no one around me was speaking uh, any other language apart from Brummie, <laughs> um, and I just, you know. I wanted to fit in, and so I wasn't interested in being different. Mm -hmm. um, but behind closed doors, obviously, I'd hear my mom speaking to her, my relatives or to my dad, or um, and I was curious to what she was saying. So I was trying to pick up um, what she was saying, and eventually just understood. But that's not to say that I was actually that engaged in wanting to understand the Yoruba language at all. I just wanted to understand what my mum was saying. <laughs> so it was almost accidental in a way. Um, and now, actually, now I've started learning a, language, a new language, um, I think it's much harder when you get older. I think it's much more important to I do it when you're younger. It is, yeah. But um, there are enough, there's, a, there's a quickness to me learning certain things, because Yoruba and Italian are quite, are quite Similar phonetically in the, the O's and A's, and it's okay. quite, it's very expressive. And so that's just it, it isn't identical, but it's a useful bridge to yeah. retention or yes. ease of pronunciation, for yes. example. Yes, exactly. Well, okay, that's only a small part of the rainbow experience that is living abroad. And living abroad is very good if you if you win the title and you're successful. <laughs> yes, thank God it went that way. But I, I, looking now back at the decision you made about. I presume leaving or parking aside your flourishing law career to come here to play at Juventus in a relatively new, not franchise, but team, although an historic club, second year of Juventus. You looked at presumably uh, language, temperature, food, culture, as well as football. Between what you were weighing up then, looking at the adventure and saying yes and sacrificing things, to where you are now, how has it gone? Well, I, I honestly feel like I couldn't lose in making the, the decision. You can only gain both good and bad um, from stepping out of your comfort zone. And I was very much in a comfort zone at Chelsea. Um, you know, after six years, won you know everything there was to win. Probably aside from the Champions League, you know, was well loved by the fans. Have friends there who are teammates, but I wasn't playing, and I was just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. Um, on Chelsea's side, I'm not sure whether they wanted to offer me a new contract or not. We never really got that far. So it was a bit of a limbo situation. And I was like, well, you know, what can I do next that's going to inspire me, that's going to bring out the best in me again, that's going to make me develop, that's going to make me just wake up every day excited? Mm. And I think the only option at that point, it certainly wasn't moving to another club in, in England, it was moving abroad. I'd already had a taster of it in America, but the American experience, aside from the fact that I grew a lot as a football player, was so um, unstable because of the trading, the trade process. You have no control whatsoever over your own destiny. So I, I didn't like that side of it. So I had a lot more control this time of saying, okay, I want to go somewhere where I'm going to grow and I'm going to 
I'm going to play and I'm going to you know, explore. And, and, and I love traveling anyway. I'm quite a curious traveler anyway. So coming to Italy was, was, was only going to be a win-win in terms of the decision. And then when I got here, um, obviously you have difficult days you know, where you don't understand what anyone's saying. Um, in training, a lot of the time, you know, I've, I've said it many times that the coach Rita is, for me, the best technical coach I've had in my career. That's Ex e extremely technical, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the drills, I was like, oh, what's going on? Where do I move? What do I? So I was, I was, I was the one that was failing in a lot of the drills, and no one wants to be that player that no. people are looking at, going, oh, you know, the international player. So there was difficult moments, you know, in training, on the pitch and off the pitch. But again, it was all just bringing out my, the, the qualities that I needed to grow, like concentration and, you know, listening and understanding a new language. You know, I like to talk, but actually I had to learn how to listen again. And so I can only say it's just a positive. You, know. you like being challenged, that comes out. I like or some of the challenges in your yeah. life that, have, that you haven't sought, they've been landed <laughs> on you. Yeah. And, but it seems to have been a life of pretty constant uh, challenges. challenges. And when yeah. you when you reach out for a decision, you almost always go, "Yeah, I can do that," or "I'll take that on," or yeah. ne I never damn the consequences because you you often fall back in your your faith, which is deep and it's yeah. really important to you. I've either heard you saying or read you talking about. There's also a slightly different culture about what doing it right is or what acceptable is. Yeah, uh, yeah. The level of how much is demanded of the success rate or application in these drills. Yeah, again, I think Rita Galina, she is particularly specific on technical drills. So, for example, she will say, I want you to touch the ball with, your, with the outside of your big toe, which sounds a little bit pedantic, mm -hmm. but that's an actual, that actually moves the ball in a certain way as opposed to just touching it with the edge. There's a purpose. There's a purpose to it. So you could probably get away with not doing it that specifically right, but she will stop you in a session mm. and say, no, this is what it is, and show you how to do it perfectly. Mm. So it's that level of specificity and demand that I think I needed to grow, even at 31. Can I ask, without being rude, the first time she stopped you and corrected you, whatever, was there a, with your level of experience and yeah. success, was there a level of, yeah, I know how to play? That's a really great question because I think that, that I think that was a decision too, like for me, in terms of saying, okay, I've won everything there is to win at one of the big, biggest clubs at, at, at Chelsea in Europe. I could have come to Juventus and said, oh, I've done it. No. <laughs> But actually, I made a conscious decision to be really humble about that and just be like, if I don't know it, I don't know it, and ask questions and speak to the coach about what she feels I can do and learn. And so I never felt like when I was stopped in a session, like, oh, ego, you know, and that can happen. We, can we happen. both know male game, female game. Yeah. And almost football or sports people kind of need that a version of that ego to survive, to thrive, but you also have to have it in check and you also have to open your ears and say, uh, I'm being taught here, but not yeah. everybody takes well to it, and I mean, that's a fact. Yeah, and I think I think I spotted early on that it's it's pretty fair. I mean, it's not, it's, yeah. it's not kind of, oh, I'm only going to coach any because if you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, and she will stop you. And so, you know, I always saw it as just trying to develop me and help me. No one's the finished product. I think even if you go over to Contenasa and see Ronaldo, you know, he, he'll be still working on his craft. So who the, who the hell am I to be like, oh, you know? So I enjoyed that side of it, actually. I, and I still enjoy that side of it, of, of the coach saying, maybe do this, or maybe, particularly in an environment I've never been in before. Talk to me about, talking about environments, um, I suppose one of the thrilling things about Syria for your team is that Albeit you're champion, you were challenged. You mm. found Milan, a topsy-turvy battle, yeah, yeah, a defeat yeah. in a... But my, my attention goes on, I know the feeling between, generally, historically, between Juve and Fiorentina. Mm -hmm. It's just a fluke that Fiorentina have a wonderful Scottish player playing for them. <laughs> and sadly, as a Scot, I have to admit that you got the better of Fiorentina, but apart from helping you win the double, keeping them at bay in, in the Scudetto, 
you had big crowds as well. Uh, emblematic of your first year in Italy in football terms, that Juve Fiorentina thing must be quite special. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I obviously know about rivalries. You know, we had it with Arsenal at Chelsea and, and City uh, over the Manchester years. City. That was, I mean, I think the word's probably hatred, you know. I'm like, going to say it got personal. Um, so I, I understand. I actually liked to see the, the level of animosity because I think you need that mm -hmm. in a championship race. But one of the reasons why I really was, was interested in Juventus as well was because of the development of women's football in this country and the fact that Juventus were pushing that and leading that. I think Fiorentina, Fede, Fiorentina were, were before Juventus, so these are two big teams trying to push the game forward. Now it's time for the Bet365 question. Our kind sponsors at the world's favourite online betting company wanted to know more about Eniola Aluko's first season at Juve, 2018-19, when she picked up the League and Cup double, Scudetto Coppa. Here she is talking about that memorable first campaign in Italy. Honestly, I, I, I didn't come to Juventus with much expectation in terms of winning yeah. the, the trophies. I didn't want to put too much pressure on that. First for myself and just in general, I thought, OK, I just want to play and see how it goes. I think it helped that Juventus had already won the league the year before. So it was already a successful team that were hungry to do more. But from a personal point of view, honestly, I think if we didn't win the double, I still would have felt like I'd gained something from the experience. However, being able to look at a trophy and say in 2019, that's what I won when I was in Italy. That, I mean, that helps. So it was kind of, you know, it was, it was a bonus, really. And doing it in a way that showed that the Italian league was quite tight. Mm. There was games we lost and we had to win it on the last day. And all of those things make for a great, um, great experience and, and title race. Any of us who've got a, a, an interest, like a passion, a growing interest in, in women's football, it's impossible not to be euphoric about what the summer brought. It's, it's a combination of many, many years. There have been many tournaments that, from an English uh, women's football perspective, have been interesting or inspirational before. But it did feel as if um, everybody's anticipation that the profile of women's football, that the quality, that the coaching, the degree of players who are now professional, and that changes you whether you're a man or a woman, it changes everything you can achieve on the pitch now regularly you can hit peak levels. But um, the audience, is, it, it's been an epiphany. This yeah. summer has been I mean, genuinely yeah. euphoric and extraordinary. You, you must feel deeply satisfied. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the game is where we all dreamed it would be. Uh, it could be in you know, when I was growing up, certainly, and as the semi-professional game started growing, we all dreamed that it could be where it is now. So I'm literally sort of seeing what I had conversations about ten years ago, like, oh, if only we could fill out stadiums, if only you know, broadcasters would put us on every week, which Sky is now doing in Italy, you know, if only I don't know. Uh, VAR could, be, you know, what, what happens in the men's game can happen in the women's game and all of that's happening and, and I think the World Cup um, demonstrated that. You know, view, some, it's certainly an appetite for women's football, I think that was always the excuse before was that, oh, you know, people don't want to watch it. Well, a lot more people are watching the World Cup than watch the men's World Cup. So, for example, the, the England team, which did so well and again, it came so close, which is a story we've had to swallow for a long time. And also then, you know, the final and the semi-final, the fact that the Netherlands were popular, yeah. that USA are a brand name in the UK. Yeah. We're talking about, we're largely talking for the moment about the, the reception in the UK of the World Cup, I guess, but it's the, it's the same the world well, over. I've asked some of the players here, like, how they, you know, how they felt about sort of, it, the, you know, Italy as a nation, how they received the women's team. Obviously, the men didn't quite, you know, play in 2018, so it was a huge opportunity for the women to kind of incite that national pride again, mm -hmm. and they definitely did that. Mm -hmm. And I think Italy were, were pretty much underestimated. No one really knew, you know, the players or, you know, how good the league was, and, and so for them to get to the quarterfinal was a huge kind of statement. 
for Italian women's football. And I think all the fans really engaged with the women's team. And that's the story, I think, for a lot of teams around the world. 25, I mean, I was working for Fox yeah. um, and doing American TV with them. On one of the nights, we did Brazil, France. I think, yeah, Brazil, France. 25 million people watched in Brazil. It's a fabulous that's audience. That's nuts. Like, women, you know, and in Brazil, they don't have a women's league. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know, notoriously, the, the federation's still quite, a, quite far behind. But 25 million people are tuning in. See, see, I know, like, you can say it's nuts because of what you've had to go through in order. Yeah. I mean, the, the, and also the cruelty of loving your time and developing at Charlton and the club disappearing overnight. Yeah. And this happens in the States too. But to my way of thinking, particularly now, and I listen, for my small part, I was coaching Glasgow University women's team in 1990. Oh, really? Badly, I'd say. But I was doing my best. <laughs> and I've always just seen it that if football is played well, you should yeah, watch it. Yeah, yeah, you watch yeah. it irrespective well, of gender. Well, that's how it should it be. It feels to me. It, that seems natural. But also, if you, if you have a passionate addiction to football, then you should have, I'll watch. watch. If it's good, I'll watch. But now I see we're um, looking at elite athletes, elite mm. people too. So, for example, you were, you were in the States. I watched an appreciation of, I mean, and they are ahead of everybody, not just in mm -hmm. ability, but mentality. Yes. In the final two games, the semi-final and the final, yeah, right. you saw things that we sat recently with a pro footballer saying, it was Trent Alexander-Arnold, I was mm. in uh, Switzerland and France last week with him, and he was saying, ah, the first Champions League final, a year ago in Kiev against Madrid, we didn't know how to win it, and they did, mm. they knew how to win it. I said, define that, and he did, the Americans, and those two games knew exactly yeah. how to win. I think they knew they were going to win before that. From the get-go, they knew they were going to win this tournament. And they had the pressure of the nation on them. They have a lot of haters. Um, they've yeah. got the whole equal pay thing. They're up against the, the US Soccer Federation, which is a very powerful federation. Those girls are powerful women, in every sense of the word, and knew that Anyone in our way, we're, we're moving. We're moving you out of the way. We're going to win, and that's the difference I think between England and France, Germany and USA. That level, that level of sort of unapologeticness that people are a bit coy about with women's sport. Mm -hmm. People still expect it to be nicey nicey and, and cushy cushy. They're like, we're not here for that. You know, look at the way they celebrated <laughs> 13 nil against Thailand. You know, people were uncomfortable with that, but well, I, mean, I, agreed with I you. think that reflected how ruthless they approached this tournament, and that's what you've got to be. If you, you you, even if even if you're running away against the team, you do your job, you push the button every time you've got yeah. a chance, and you don't pat them on the head and sorry, yeah. it's 13 0 you, you, Doesn't matter who it is, yeah. men's, women's, boys, girls, football. You you play to win. And all right, taunt, you maybe don't taunt. Yeah, or whatever. There's, there's games. But this shit, idea yeah. that that was the that was sort of the wrong thing to be doing. I think that separates mentality. Yeah, absolutely. And also game management. I mean, there's, there's, I think it was viewed with distaste in the UK. I saw when you know the Americans would be clever about how much time was taken over something or whether a foul was a foul or not. And, and that, yeah. people wouldn't have been saying that in the men's game, in my opinion. I think they would actually. I think, think, I think, I think that's what, and I think that's what makes it great now because the levels of opinion. I mean, the fact <laughs> that the fact that that celebration divided so, such opinion was great because that's what it would do in the men's game. Mm -hmm. If I don't know, if Raheem Sterling is sliding, doing slide knee slides at 13 nil against a weaker international nation, I think you probably have the same level of debate. And, and, and that's what I love about the fact that women's football now, people aren't seeing it as, you know, women's football, oh, let's treat it nice. They're seeing it as football and, and, and universal debate, and people are, are falling out about it. An and intensity of criticism, if necessary, intensity too. Intensity of criticism. Like, that's what we've wanted for such a long time. We've wanted the press to cover us. We've wanted the press to write about us, good or bad. And as players, we've got to kind of be ready for, you know, ready for the good or bad. And as you said, we're professional athletes now. So that comes with a level of scrutiny that, you know, you've got to be ready for. Raheem, he was going to come up in this because 
It's my perspective that he's an extraordinary footballer who's been coached by one of the best, the, the male equivalent of Rita, perhaps. Um, yeah, of course. His yeah. trajectory is extraordinary, and and the way in which he's been treated, particularly by branches of the UK media, has been outrageous. And I, it got me angry, and therefore I'm putting out there to you my point of view. Maybe you disagree, but I watched the way that uh, Rapino was treated mm. post World Cup about. Mm. Um, there was one moment at a presentation when the crowd is singing her name and she gets up, annoys it, does a little dance, sit down. It was a deluge of looking at, look at her making this all about her. Won again at an award ceremony immediately after winning, uh, becoming world champions again. Signing a young kid's autograph while not actually looking him in the eyes if she should have been hugging him or something. The kid gets his autograph, she's done him that nicety, and there seemed to be, and she spoke, I thought, in an Eloquent, uplifting, right. brilliant way, but also the message, eloquent for sure. What she's saying, you know, touched everybody, whether you watch women's football or you don't, men's football or you don't. And, and immediately what that seemed to draw out was a, a, a backlash, a readiness to get after her, mm. maybe because she's seen as too outspoken. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I equated the treatment of Raheem and, and Megan no, I think all. that's a great equation, and I think it's so multifaceted because I think as, as athletes, when you put yourself out there on things that are non-sporting, mm -hmm. it is a guarantee that you will be attacked. It's just a guarantee. Because people don't see you as deserving of having a voice in that, in that sphere, no matter how eloquent you are. Oftentimes, you can get the benefit of it because people go, oh, actually, that's refreshing. you know, that's refreshing, yeah. that, you know. But the reality is, is that we have these huge platforms where one tweet can change the world. So it's a decision. And, you know, I've had many arguments with, with footballers and, and different athletes about, well, do you just want to be the athlete that scored a lot of goals? Or do you want to be someone that actually, when it mattered, and when things affected your team and affected you, you spoke up about it? When it, when you, you don't always have to speak up. I don't always speak up when something happens. But there's pointed moments when you can, and it, and it can actually change the conversation. So I'm not at all surprised to see the level of backlash from Megan Rapino and Raheem Sterling, but I think in the long run, those are the athletes you remember. Mm -hmm. And one thing I say in the book is that my mom always taught me about being able to use attributes like being hard-headed and strong and vocal for the benefit of yourself and other people. Well, by the time that people are listening to this version of the big interview, they'll be able to go out and buy They Don't Teach This, yeah. your life story. Yeah, I mean, there are a number of things we could pick on, but I, I want to try and make this seamless in that the World Cup you were commentating on in the States, where should you have been playing? I'm talking about form first. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think there's a debate that I, I, I could have been selected. Um, I had a conversation with Phil Neville in early 2018 in Russia, actually. I was in the ho ITV hotel with all the sort of lads, uh, I call them lads, but they were actually my heroes growing McCoyst, up. for example. You know, ra ra yeah, Ali McCoyst, um, Ryan Quite Giggs. Quite a lad, little to say for himself. <laughs> Gary Neville. Game of chess in bed at nine. Yeah. yeah, so I happened to be able to have a chat with Phil Neville at the time mm. and said, listen, you know, where am I at with, with it? Yeah. Like, either way, it's fine. My life's moved on. I'm very happy with, with my life and, you know, I have 102 caps, so in a way I already feel like the glass is already full but I'm still playing and, and you know I feel that I can still contribute and he very much said look listen the doors still open um, if you perform well like any other striker you could be selected now oftentimes you know I like to look people in the eye and believe that that's you know that's a, that's genuine but oftentimes a lot of coaches give players lines and you don't really know how genuine it is now I'd like to think it was genuine at the time but I remember thinking, well, if I do go in and bang goals in at Juventus, are you gonna, you know, are you gonna risk? And, and I call it a risk because, you know, I think it's safe to say there's a lot of strong opinion about, you know, my whole fallout with England and the FA, and so it, I think it's a risk in the sense that there's, there's, there'll be so much media attention around that potential selection. But ultimately, we're talking about football. You scored 11. It was 14 in the league. Okay. I scored 14, 14 goals in the league. 16 in all competitions. I think finished third. Job done. Four. So, and we won the double in a team where they have a, as big a name as Chelsea or Bayern Munich or anyone else. 
in a league where we only won the, the league by one point. Certainly more competitive than France or, you know, or, or in England. So if, if I was arguing, if, you know, if I was sort of outside of myself and arguing for me, I think I'd have a strong case. Okay. So I think the long answer is, I think that question is, is probably better answered by Phil Neville, but it, 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 it doesn't help to think that there's other factors that stopped me, that would have stopped me being selected outside of just pure football. In your book, one of the contrary things is that until things go badly wrong under Mark Sampson and his, his coaching Normally. team, whenever you go and argue with the FA, or your recording of his, they were willing to work with me, they listened, they were quite receptive, and they felt you were one of, in an extraordinary era, including the players who've begun playing seven, eight, nine, ten years before you, you've been part of an extraordinary era of brilliant mm. English women footballers. It's, it's the case, isn't it? Mm. I mean, it's no flattery yeah, on my part. I mean, a lot I look of back, you look back and you think, unbelievable. Yeah. And then you, you, but you're one of their icons. And yet, when you write the book, I suspect it's cathartic. You've spent a lot yes. of time thinking oh my God, about absolutely. it. absolutely. <laughs> when you look back on that situ situation, how you're treated by your coach at national level, and then the process you have to go through and how you're subsequently treated by the FA, where are you at now? Uh, because you try, you, you often talk about trying to accrue wisdom. Mm. Uh, you're a brilliant mind, you're a first class honours degree and a lawyer, practicing lawyer, in, in several different practices. Your deep faith, which conditions how you react to things mm. in your life. You know, look back. What, what, what have you learned? What... Well, this was a big thing, Graham, for the book because we had to decide the tone of it. Whilst telling the entire story that's already well documented, there was a risk that I was pouring over your ground. There was a risk that I was crying over spilt milk. There was a risk that, well, this case is settled. Why are you still talking about it? But it's a huge part of my story and a huge part of my life and a huge part of who I am today. What I wanted to do was, uh, was tell the story again, but also give insight into how I felt at those moments. And how what someone says is one thing, how you feel about it stays with you. So really give the reader insight about how I felt, because a lot of, a lot of the reporting at the time was like, well, uh, that, yeah, well, some, she was called lazy, so. He shouted at her in front of loads of people, so. And there was a lot of that. But I think in a book, you can get the idea of the accumulation of that it starts to have a real impact. So I think, I think I was very, very careful to try as much as possible to tell the story, explain how I felt, but end it with, but now I can look these people in the eye genuinely and forgive them. And I've forgiven them. <clears throat> I've already forgiven them. And the, the whole, you know, there's a whole chapter on forgiveness, pretty much. Um, the, the whole sort of epilogue. But you're about to go and continue audiobook reading, they don't teach this. Yes. Um, enjoy it, we have to let you go because the studio is waiting for you. That's a yes. nice phrase to be able to say, sorry, the studio's waiting for you. <laughs> I have to go now. Uh, I suppose I end in a, in a pretty stereotypical way by saying forza Juve, forza Eniola. Thank you so much. Prego, no, prego, grazie. Grazie mille, prego, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening to The Big Interview. It's produced by me, which sounds egotistical, but it's also true, Graham Hunter, and Backpage. Our music is by Beer Jacket, who else? Editing by Charlie McGarry. Thank you to our hosts at Acast and our loyal sponsors at Bet365. We're also supported by our socios. Find out how to become a socio, how to support us, at patreon.com forward slash Graham Hunter. Here endeth the lesson.